Welcome. My name's FX Feeney. I'm going to be moderating the conversation here. So I thought, let's, uh, I'm going to feel like a bit of a lion tamer because I'm surrounded by talent. Uh, but let's welcome up, uh, the, we'll start by welcoming the cast first. We're going to have Bo Knapp. Will you come up? we got uh, Luke Hemsworth. Malaya Rivera. And uh, let's see, is, um, is Alexis uh, Bedell here? Is, is, am I correct? Maybe not. Okay. In any case, we have uh, also from behind the scenes, we've got executive producer uh, Zach Weinstein. We've got the uh, musician, the composer of the music, Nima Farkara. Editor Brian Bairdon. We have two of the writers, two of the co-writers, also uh, producers as well. We've got Carlisle Eubank, <laughs> David Figuerio, <laughs> and the other director, John Stahlberg Jr. <laughs> are you Carl or is that? Yeah. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hey, David. We're going to share my mic. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I want to I want to spread the questions out after a moment, but I, I want to start with you, John, because uh, something that you said by way of uh, introducing the film, you know, in another context, you talked about Bad Day of Black Rock as a as a source of inspiration. I thought, you know, we got a room full of cineasts here as well, and I thought. That's a good example of a particular kind of crime film. I would, almost a, a personal one in the sense that a, a, a man who doesn't expect to be a detective turns into one. Right. And it x-rays the whole society that he's looking at. So right. I wanted to just draw you out about yeah. that and then we'll get rolling. Well, I'm a huge fan of John Sturgis. Um, the Greatest Escape is probably my favorite film. Uh, so I got into his work early on, but I actually didn't think about Bad Day at Black Rock while we were shooting. I was talking with Carla. And um, Brian Bernan, the editor, and I were, were cutting the film nearby, and I, I saw, I think I came into the editing room one day, and I said, this, is this kind of like, are we aping Bad Day at Black Rock? Just with Spencer Tracy kind of taking a train yeah. out in the middle of nowhere. And we didn't film any trains, but then we decided to add all this train <laughs> stuff in, just because yeah. I thought that means it's a lonely town. Right. Um, but you know, I remember the beginning of that movie, the, uh, the, it's the first time the train has stopped, for anybody who hasn't seen it. Uh, but it's, it's in the Museum of Modern Art or something. It's like a catalog of the film. It's one of the, yeah. 
you know, and it's about a guy, like you said, it's a guy who uncovers this mystery. He doesn't really mean to do it. He's got a history. He's missing an arm, so he has this war past um, that you don't really know about. It just sort of makes it intriguing. It reminded me of Caleb's character, the brother that yes. he plays. Yes, yes. Uh, just in fact, you don't know really what his malfunction is. You sort of get it at the end, um, but yeah, but it's an unfolding thing. Right, and, and you actually, I mean, throughout you sort of make the, the past pregnant by not explaining much. It, you're, it's basically right in front of you or, it, or it's not, you know? Right. And, and, and with respect to, you know, I noticed you also had talked about uh, the, the Belgian film Ardan, which, yeah. uh, which is a brother, a, a conflict between brothers, which is wonderful, but you also, I think, referenced Blue, Blue Velvet because that brings us to Brian, yeah. who, who cut Blue Velvet. Right. And, no, 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 no. And, I was I sort of apprentice. Oh, oh, yeah. apprentice. I was the little apprentice on it. But when I saw that on his resume, I was well, like, yeah. <laughs> but it was sort of like a lot. film had to exist between David Lynch and David Fincher yeah. somewhere. So sure, <laughs> and I, I guess, uh, well, what that brings to mind is the duality that, that, uh, you know, that John is exploring here. So if you could talk about just what were the particular challenges in getting what, how you were keeping a balance with all these elements that you've got, that, that John's giving you in this story. No balance whatsoever. Everything, you might not believe this, it was all cut in the camera. John was a very steady hand guiding, and uh, we just whittled away until we found what we found. <laughs> well, that's great. I, I wanted to, the, you know, in, in line with that question, I want to talk to, you know, Carl Eubank and, and David Frigerio about, you know, working with just the development of the story. You, there was another writer on board, and how? A, what was the? Did it begin with just contemplating Bitcoin, or were you trying to deal with a small town and, and international crime? What was the? How did this story brew and develop for you guys? It started off with a. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, uh, in the uh, thank you credits. John and I failed to mention our wives mm. who let us go play for two months. <laughs> 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 uh, it started off with uh, a script from Jeffrey Inger, which uh, we actually did not read just because I don't like to rewrite other people's work. So we just said, Carl and I just sat down and sort of replotted another story based on what we heard. So it was as simple as that. And we had this idea of cryptocurrency because it's new on into the space, Carl and I too. And, uh, it just uh, it, it sort of mended really well with our story. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think we we thought about crypto because it's something everyone talks about, but no one totally understands. Like all the characters. Right. 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 You you kind of had it in the audience too. So you know, it, and I guess it, this is a question for the three of you as storytellers. You know, where do you where do you place the tennis net? You had to be deciding that every step of the way while developing the script. And I was thinking with the editor too, you're going, okay, what do people know? When do they know it? How much do we reveal? Right. Talk a little about that. Well, the, I mean, the whole metaphor of cryptocurrency is sort of that it's unsolvable, obviously. It, it in and of itself is a mystery. Uh, so, so it works as a metaphor. Uh, we did wrestle with the idea of what do, we, what do we show? What are we telling the audience? How much do they know? We kind of went crazy because we were, we were trying to create this sense of leaning forward and reflect the, the central character's journey through the film, not understanding really how he fits into the world, where he fits into this mystery, the A story, but also um, really where he fits in with his father and his brother. So we were sort of trying to track the A story with the B story. It was, but it was a little bit unusual, but Dave and I and Carla, we, we worked almost every day. We rewrote scenes and continued to kind of play with it, but it was a living thing as we went through the process. Well, what's interesting, you know, there's been a bit of controversy, I suppose, in advance of the film where Bitcoin adherents are feeling this is an anti-Bitcoin yeah. movie. And I'm thinking, well, wait a second, I'm watching the film, and I don't think it's against Bitcoin. What it's yeah. showing is dark pools of opportunity that, you know, it just, it, it, sure. it's simply there. It's a cautionary tale rather than a, 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 sure. pro, pro, a polemic. I'll you know? let Dave answer, answer this, but I think that it's just, it's like, they call it fiat money. That's what all these crypto guys are going to say. They say, well, what about fiat money? Money, but it's just money, um, and they say that there's there's money laundering with that too, and we say okay, so that's fair. But there's there's characters like Jeremy Harris's character Earl. He's doing it the way Dave does it. He mines cryptocurrency, and he's doing it necessarily um, not anymore. 
Yeah, not anymore. Ethereum is way too much, too too right now. Right now. But yeah, we. Uh, I've been actually getting in a lot of Twitter wars with people from the Bitcoin sort of or cryptocurrency uh, space that are just like, you know, it's a two minute promotional trailer. They're going ape shit on the part of my friend. Uh, ape shit on the trailer. Like this is so not accurate. And I'm like, you guys got to see the movie first. Just calm down. If you hate it after, great, no problem. But like. Just calm down. Yeah, but it's not uh, this indictment. But uh, yeah, it's it's you know it's a pro pro cryptocurrency right. and a con for the cryptocurrency, which is what the, what it is right now. So right. But it's definitely a, a, a new space. So. Well, in terms of the space of the movie, I want to talk a bit to the cast, and I wanted to start with you, Malaya, Malaya Rivera, because you're the art dealer, and of the characters in the film, you're the the one with the, in, a, it's in an odd way, you're a gyroscope whirling in your own void, and I'm wondering, how did you, how did you particularly prepare to, to be authentic inside that character with, with what you had to deal with? To be a gyroscope whirling in my own void? <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I don't know. I mean, there's some characters that you approach, and you know they're quite close to you, and you can really understand their motivations and how they walk in the world, and um, this was not one of those characters. So I, um, I, but but she resonated with me when I first read the script. I was excited to work with John, and um, I thought it would be really fun to play a really off the wall character like this. Um, but she's so so different to me. Um, I s kind of got a foothold in with uh, her loneliness, mm -hmm. and I just. Um, I just, I mean, it's a you know, really human condition and I feel, so, it, I felt lonely sort of my whole life. We felt feelings of other and, sorry, I just got really heavy. Um, <laughs> but I feel like that's, you know, when you're trying to approach a character, you just have to find sort of an emotional nugget. And then beyond that, it's just layering character, mm -hmm. um, layering behavior. Um, yeah, and um, that's sort of, I did a lot of talking with John about drug use. It's not a movie about drug use, but we wanted that sort of smack of authenticity with her. Right, case. right. It became, it, well, it, it's interesting that, and it, I guess the loneliness became your kind of default position whenever there was a, a question about what to do, just go to that point in yourself or in the character. With, um, with respect to the drugs, it wasn't like addiction, it was more about the loneliness or. or a hundred percent, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of a way of. Um, dealing with intimacy and dealing with loss and pain. Yeah. Yeah, and so we sort of discussed where exactly in the you know in her sort of addiction journey she was at various points in the scenes. Well, with respect to that, I want to draw Bo and Luke out about because the loneliness and loss is certainly there between the brothers. It's a really powerfully drawn relationship, and you guys. I mean, you had to be in each other's faces, but you also had to be, you know, in conflict and, and in bond. And I thought you brought that off quite well, by the way. It, the, the reversals were really fun. But if you could talk about your process and how you how you all worked that out. Smart brother, goddamn. Look, let's not get confused. This is a movie about potatoes. Okay. Uh, my argument, we can we can this is called Cryptata, not Crypto. Um, potato point. Uh, no, it's very interesting because uh, I think loneliness, loneliness is a big part of this film. Um, and we all have this idea that people who deal in crypto are these lonely people that sit in a, in a basement somewhere and have no life. But the reality is that they are like, they're all in. You know, they're, they're, they're a part of our society. Crypto is a part of our society, and it's creeping in. Um, my approach to the character was from a point of view of absolute ignorance, uh, which was very, very great because I, mean, I had no insight into crypto at all, and I still don't see it doing Can I borrow a five bucks, David? Yeah, because you know, I, I, my character was. was, was he was a he was a damaged individual from uh, something else, and and I left all of the uh, the brains up to up to Bo, uh, which he is very very good at. Most it was in a stretch. Um, what do I have to say? Just saying. Um, I had such a good time. Um. Points I remember. <laughs> um, but for me, it wasn't, you know, Bitcoin and all that. It was, it was 
the society and yeah. it was about yeah. a kid trying to figure out who he was. Um, you know, running from his blood, running from uh, everything he grew up with. And it's one of those moments in life you realize everything is right in front of you yeah. or behind you. Um, so that, that's what it was for me. That's, that's, I had a great time with these people. Yeah, he, he, he was a family drama for us, and I think, yeah. you know, like, like the, the, the crypto part for us was actually a very minute part of the story, and I know that, you know, Bo and I connected, and Kurt and Bo and I were connected in, in a way that was very authentic, um, and every moment that we spent together was, I, I think, hopefully reflected, you know, in, in the scenes that we did together. Um, and, and I think for all of us, that, yeah, that the, the crypto took, uh, 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 you know, it's unfortunate. I, I think it's unfortunate this film is called Crypto because I, I really don't think it's about cryptocurrency. I, I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's a family drama. Uh, there's some mob bosses thrown in there, it's a heroin, and it's, uh, you know. Actually, the original title of the film was called The Return, and I, before I even read it, they were pitching it to me, and they said, why don't you talk about crypto? And I remember the producers were saying, <laughs> yeah. I, I was just sort of throwing oh, it out there. Oh, I guess it's going to be the title of the script. Oh, this is a soft fire. It's going to be epic. In a way, it's not good. It sort of implies there's going to be some danger or there's something. But I also just think it, it implies a mystery. It implies just something unknowable. Yeah, and, and something futuristic without necessarily being fantasy, too. Right. There's, right. there's that energy, too. I, I want to, you know, the music is, is such a key component, and one of the things I admired most about it is how the music, as it were, disappears into the, into the propulsion of the film in a, in a really good way. And I wanted to ask you, uh, Nima Fakara, about how you, how you developed this music, you know, working with John to, to make well, this, this happen. Uh, it's actually a funny story because um, I 90% of the film was I didn't write against picture uh, thanks to Brian and thanks to John Wall uh, right even before the, Ooh, sh the, the shooting the, sh the, the shoot I actually wrote the score uh, so I wrote pretty much about 45 minutes of music before uh, a frame was shot and mm. um, as uh, as the cuts were coming on Brian was kind of uh, taking my music and just actually putting it against picture. Um, and then that's how the score became what it was. Uh, Brian, would send me, uh, Br uh, Brian and John would send me actually scenes and be like, what do you think? And I'm just like, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually had, some, I mean, Nima had given us these long suites of music, like you said, with a lot of changes built into each track. We were able to play it even on set. I remember Bo, it was day one, I had this little speaker and I was playing this stuff, just to kind of remind people because we were all goofing around, you know, because Luke was around. And then I just want to remind people this is supposed to, what's the vibe of the film. So I would play it, and uh, and then we got into post, and Brian started to kind of place it. The editor, Brian Burden, he started to place it into the into the film. Then we were able to invite him into the editing room, watch the process, and go, ah, you're using it that way. Okay, well, what if I did another? That becomes the family thing, and I do that again. And yeah. So it was this kind of organic process. Um, that's great. It was unusual, but we loved it. We wanted to do it like that all the Well, it was very effective, because you know, oftentimes you hear the horror stories of, you know, they, yeah. they do the film, it's somebody writes the score, and then, right. you know, the director falls in love with the temp track, <laughs> or, 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 yeah, it's, it's like, so. Can I just, you know, oh, sorry. Go for uh, it. First off, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he was, uh, it elevated this film so much. Okay. Yeah. It, it made it, it's, it seems so profound, it was crazy. And our, our DP is here, I don't know why he's yeah. not yeah. on this. Peter, yeah. 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 Oh, I just I want to Zach, I, you know, as executive producer Zach Weinstein, I wanted to ask just what you know how you kept uh, how you wrangled all these cats. I mean, if you could just talk about riding herd on all this thing. Yeah, yeah. and um, obviously it was a great team. Uh, it was a lot of us. It was definitely not just me by any means. But uh, yeah, no, it was, it was a great team. It was a great experience. Uh, we had a lot of fun on set. Uh, yeah, Luke and Bo are allowed to handle. Um, but no, it was a lot of fun. We had a great time. And it, was, it was a nice little family. So we enjoyed it. Great. I want to invite curveballs. That you ask for some curveballs. Let's, mm -hmm. let's have some up from the audience now. Any questions for anybody on the panel here? Uh, I will repeat your question, so just so you know, I'll sound like a Monty Python translator. But your your question right there, man. Um, 
Firstly, congratulations. I really love the film. Uh, secondly, my question is, did the writers add any characters in the final hour before production? And was your skeleton always the same, or did it kind of develop as you went along? This question is primarily to the writers. Is, did any characters come along in the last hours, as, uh, final hour, so to speak, before production? And did the skeleton of the movie remain pretty much the same through the production? I think the skeleton of the film yeah. remained pretty uh, constant throughout. Like, yeah. I'd say from first draft to final product, like, you're looking at a pretty honest translation of the film. As far as adding characters, I don't, yeah, I think, I don't so. think we added any new characters. I mean, no, no I think, uh, uh, no, I think, 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 I we do get the other ends with us. So. <laughs> 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 I need a shout out to, uh, well, we actually cast another character, and I have to give a shout out to Louise Spinner, who uh, gave us a Luke with like a week, because we lost our character and we had to get someone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had to cast someone else. And 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 we that's okay. great. Thanks, in, in relation to that question, <laughs> you know, it is. I, I was struck as the as the movie was beginning to have, so to speak, it bringing full circle. You know, that's that's a strategy that might have arrived late. Was it always from the beginning that you were going to have the, the father emerge from the truck? Or no, originally there, that was the big change we did. There, there was a uh, it was a lot of as Kurt called it. He's like, you got a lot of gun blood. And it was this little shoot John, out. John, 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 stop the move, okay? Uh, <laughs> I am compelled, but I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but that's so okay. Play the movie. Play it. Yeah. That's my girl. <laughs> you have a lot of gunplay at the end of the movie. We said, yeah, it'll be like uh, the shootout in Key because you can't afford the shootout. <laughs> he says, have you seen your budget? And uh, we realized we were, we were trying to do something that, that was too big. So we said, how do we pull it down scope-wise and make it still feel like it's this satisfying ending? So we reconfigured that. And, uh, well, that's we, we needed Luke to kill somebody, though, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Luke had to shoot somebody, that's for sure. It was either you or that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I don't See, is there a question in, way in the back that I'm overlooking in the light here? Any, any hands? Oh yes, way way in the back. Yes, you. Thank you. I just want to know whose tongue was this? <laughs> <laughs> I can't ask that. That would be my tongue. No, it was Penelope's tongue. But in real life, it was a It's it's supposed to be you know, an answer to this stuff, but like it, it's supposed to that moment that the guy is kind of inducing it her to. Uh, Oh. A coma type thing, you hear just like a night, he's kind of got these surgical glaze, he's doing something. Mm. Then you hear the next day at the diner, the cop, that's the reason we put a cop there to kind of give you that exposition. He says, uh, old lady, wild lady from the gallery, and it's sort of off camera, but he says, I heard she bit off her own tongue. Yeah. Ah, yeah. There you go. Good question, though, yeah. Because you, are, you weren't listening. How <laughs> 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 <I'm here. laughs> Classic respect for the old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Gentlemen, very simple there, Yes. Surrender to it. I thought some of the shots could have been a little longer. I had trouble reading them. <laughs> an I feel like it's the greatest piece of cinema. How do our actors How do our actors feel watching themselves with the with live audience? I feel yeah. A lot of close-ups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my face for ninety minutes. <laughs> and your nose wasn't broken. My nose wasn't broken. It's a little bit of It's a little bit Because I think, I feel, I don't know what you think. 
You're, <laughs> remember satisfied, right? Yeah. You see, you go, eh, yeah, we would have done that differently. At the time, I was like, this is the greatest piece of theater ever. But now, watching it, yeah, we would have done that differently. <laughs> so, but watching it with, watching with a, uh, an audience is always 50 times better than actually. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it is a joy to watch it. Except this, uh, <laughs> 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 you guys, you're, you're, basically, you're, you're testing it with a live audience. Yeah. Well, I wasn't joking, I guess. We didn't do any test screenings. So we, our test screenings were Dave watching it for the fifth time with Carlisle in the editing room with Ryan. We did bring Kurt in uh, at one point. We just brought a few people in, uh, did very small things. But uh, So it is fun. I remember, um, Stan over, he works with the guys at Lionsgate and Brightstone, and he said, uh, you know, you're going to want to go out to dinner during the premiere? I said, dinner? This is what I did it for. I to watch people react, see right. if they, it's interesting every time. Is there a, you know, a, other film like that I've worked with, you know, there was like a, one editor spoke of the canary in the mind chef moment where you know that a movie's working, where you, you're waiting for that first laugh. If they go for that, okay, good, now we're in. We're, was there a moment like that that you guys were monitoring for? Well, th this time I actually leaned over today because again, we haven't watched it with a crowd this large. So uh, there was a, somebody laughed, when was it like in the Malaya, and you're like depressing art gallery scene. Okay, great. <laughs> Someone laughed at something you said in there, and I leaned over today and they're laughing. I think that was me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 How did you lie? Did you, was there anything? Yeah, I, um, th I think the laughter, like I, I got the humor so much during this screening. I mean, I think when I was, when we were working, it felt really heavy and dark. Mm -hmm. Whirling dervish. Style. But I think the humor really comes out seeing it all together, and I, I loved it. I loved sort of hearing everybody respond that way. That's I, great. I, this was a this was a lonely shoot. I feel like, <laughs> I, like you know, like there was a brotherhood that went on and a sisterhood. But I, I was away from my family, and and there was there's something that, that you sort of latch onto as an actor as well. You're like, why well, you know, let's we're in this position, and we're gonna take that as far as we can. And so I would just literally walk all day by myself when I wasn't shooting. And isolate yourself. And isolate yeah. yourself, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and that was, that was, you know, that was, a, that was a big theme, I think, for everyone in this room. A whole bunch of isolated people that were somehow crisscrossing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a black well, I think I, I have a, a kind of concluding Which question. Which is what life is, man. <laughs> you know, for all these islands. <laughs> well, off of what Luke is saying, I wonder, I just to, to poll everybody, you know, here you are experiencing your film with, with a live audience for the first time, and I'm also thinking you've, you've had some time to reflect. Is there anything particularly that you learned from this film that you didn't have before that you're going to carry forward with you to the next thing you're working on? Is there any? It's for everybody, and if you want to take it. Uh, I mean, for me, it was, uh, I definitely will produce everything I write, because it's a little more sort of, not in a controlling way, because John, and John and Peter and Brian, they all put the film on their shoulders and just, I mean, we had no budget for this thing, so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was just work with people you'd like to work with, too, because it was just a really good experience all the way around, so. You know, we had battles every single day, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we made a pretty good film. Yeah, I would just echo that and just say that uh, it's important, I learned that it's important to have somebody watching your back, which uh, David did, so I, uh, I really appreciated that. You know, it's, it's tough when you're trying to do stuff and you've got everybody second-guessing it. And I realized the value in having a producer who's uh, got the best interest of the film you know, uh, yeah. prioritized. It's tough, though. That's, that's a slippery slope with these kind of low-budget films is that I told the other producers who were great guys, and initially we just I said, look, we're going to have problems on set. Like, you're going to be protecting the money, but I'm going to protect the film, and that's, we're going to have issues. And, of course, we had some issues, but at the end of the day, it was just, you know, the work, it's, it's all about the work, so it's all about the film. How about you, Carl? I mean, I think you learn something every time, because as a writer, you're seeing, you know, you, you play the movie in your head, mm -hmm. you write it, and then when you see it on, the screen, you're watching that translation process. Yeah. So 
you go, oh, I would have said something different there. I would have, you know, maybe I overdid it there. You know, you're just always right. Well, what would you apply, apply to the next thing? Is it do more now, or less, or just kind of? I mean, different, on? different. Like in every movie, <laughs> asks something different or asks for something different. Um, yeah. This movie, you know, we we knew we weren't going to have much of a budget, and I think that if there wasn't the, the amount of dialogue there was, it would have been a lot of empty space, mm. and it would have been even more lonely feeling than it was. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are other projects that I think would would ask for a lot less dialogue, you know. Yeah. So, I don't know, just, just, you're always learning. You're always trying to get better. How about you, Zach? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, kind of echoing what everyone else is saying, just, uh, you know, make full shit with your friends. Uh, work with the people you like. Uh, you know, I don't really care how talented somebody is. If they're not a good person, they're not fun to be around. I don't really want to, you know. Right. Just surround yourself with good people. That's yeah. great. And Brian? Continue to ignore the advice of the actors. Never work with a David Figurio again. And the same thing that everybody's saying. Uh, I mean, for, for a musician like myself, it's such an isolated uh, business, and uh, it was just a pleasure to be able to kind of be able to bounce ideas and just have somebody actually to be able to kind of watch my back. It's just same with John and Brian, just kind of, it was a fun process and I would love to do it again the same exact way over again. How about you? <laughs> well, is there any, any surprise that, that you can take away with you to the next thing? Uh, you know, actually we were talking about the music earlier and John did play some of the music that you were writing during the filming process mm -hmm. before a few of my scenes. And that was, I've never had that experience before and it was amazing and it really, um, it helped me a lot. So I don't know if I can do that the next time, but <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> yeah, Bo, this is a very layered performance you give because you've got to be, I mean, there's like a guy in you trying to get out, but at the same time you're reining him in the whole way. And I'm thinking, you know, you've, you've done a lot of work, but I, I, one, was, you know, here you're carrying the film, you know, and in a sense right. you have to be, become the detective in addition to being a protagonist. So what did you take away? Uh, the, with, with the work I've done in the past, it's always, you know, characters or <laughs> yokels, <laughs> drug dealers or something like that. <laughs> but uh, doing a movie like this, especially with friends and family, it's, uh, it's just good for the soul, you know, for me as an actor. You know, I can go on and, and, and do these big movies or whatever, and it's, it's uh, I get nothing out of it. I mean, it, as, as much joy as I got out of working with John and Dave and, and Carlisle and everybody. Um, it's just, this is why I started doing it. You know, just to say, say words. <laughs> oh, I can't remember. <laughs> 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 so it's great to do this. You know, for, for a guy who plays a man of few words, Luke, you, you, yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let's talk to me again. Uh, about me. Uh, uh, no, I, I, what I don't do in this film is uh, the thing that I'm constantly astounded by uh, when I act with really, really great actors is I'm always. I'm always blown away with how dedicated everybody is. And I, and I always rock out thinking that, ah, oh, no, that guy who just phoned in, you know, Kurt Russell's done a million films, he'll be like, yeah, whatever. But then you get there and you do these things and your eyes are open and your soul is open because they care so much and Bo cared so much. And, you know, there's not one performance in this film where they go, oh, that, that's the whole film. Everyone's just absolutely beautiful, and, um, and and I think that's that's probably a fault with me that I expect the worst from everyone. <laughs> I, um, but I'm glad that I get to experience everyone giving their best. I think, I think that's, that's well, it is a, a magnificent moment, uh, two magnificent moments with Kurt Russell, where he watches you guys drive off to breakfast together, and then it's 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 rhymed at the end where he's really at peace. And I just, a hand for Kurt Russell, yeah. who couldn't yeah. be here. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, 
That guy did not have a trailer. He had a, he stayed at the Marriott Courtyard in Kingston, New York. It was a ridiculously crappy hotel. Great. Well, you know, we, we take away with us a, a fantastic movie, and I want to thank you all for making it for us and for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.